Cisco Web Application Firewall Leveraging Radware, Log4j. All right, we've got our netcat listening and we've got our malicious LDAP server and our web server that's gonna pass back that malicious payload. So let's go ahead and see what happens here. If everything is working, we should get a reverse shell and we do. Let's go ahead and see if the payload was delivered. We know that because we've got the reverse shell, but we can see a success of 200 here as well. So let's go ahead and enable web application firewalling. We already have a VIP installed and ready to go, but we need to install the security elements specifically for web application firewalling. So we're gonna give this secure web application an ID. We'll call it log4j-web. And in fact, we're gonna use the same name uh, for the name itself. Good to go, app wall service enabled. It's gonna be in line and we can submit, but let's go back up there and make sure we enable secure web application. Okay, go ahead and submit. And there it is, the details around it. Let's go ahead and save it and make sure that we apply and everything looks successful here. Now, this does nothing at this point. Think of this as an object. The object's created, you can leverage the service, but we need to apply it. So let's go to application delivery, our virtual services, and we're gonna go ahead and edit our virtual service and go ahead and add that secure web application that we just created. All right, we'll go ahead and submit and we'll save. Everything looks good so far. The next step in this is that we need to now go ahead and configure the web application rules that we want to trigger on for Log4j. So Radware has a collection of strings that we need to look for. So let's go to security. Let's go to secure web application. And we'll go ahead and edit the security policy now. Now we could have done this beforehand before we applied it. Doesn't really matter here. In our case, this is a lab environment. Okay, we're gonna go to configurations and let's check out a few things. We're gonna go to tunnels and log4j web. And you can see there's a bunch of settings here, general properties, host names, that we can add HTTP properties, parsing properties, HTTP message size, security bypass, uh, and then there's also tunnel mode. We're gonna jump back to security policy. So let's go ahead to our, our log4j web application firewall settings. All right, we're just gonna quickly set an internal security page here. This is gonna have a, a, a reference ID attached to it. So uh, when you go to the, the, the site itself, there's gonna be a message. There's also gonna be an ID there that we can reference and that we can reference that in our log files. We'll save and apply this. All right, we're moving along. So let's go to vulnerabilities. And we're gonna go ahead and add a custom pattern. And this is gonna be URL header and parameters. And I've got a list of them here that we're gonna go and copy and paste. We'll do a couple and then uh, I'll just add them all here. But uh, the first one is looking specifically for dollar sign, JNDI. Um, the other one is looking for the JNDI colon LDAP. And then you can see RMI, DNS, and we'll go and continue to add these as we move along. So we'll do one more and then uh, I'll jump to um, and skip the rest of them, but I will have them all added. All right, all added, work is done. Now we could also click where used and we can go ahead and submit it. So where used is gonna let us know where we're leveraging this. So let's go ahead and apply this. We are good to go at this point in time and let's go ahead and test it. So we'll copy that selection here of that string. We'll go ahead and insert it. We've got our net cat listening and there's that case number ID. So that, that ID number that we inserted in the web page will help us parse the log specifically for this activity. And you can see there's no shell access whatsoever. So we could take this number and again, we can filter it in our logs. Okay, let's jump back in here for a second and let's go to forensics. Let's see, we definitely did not get access. 
But let's go ahead and we certainly do have some pattern violations that have been detected here. So there's the time, the severity, uh, the generated by, reported on. There's the, the, uh, the host, the application path, the description. And then you see here, there's the URI, any parameters, and then the parameter value. We certainly uh, have reference to that. And that transaction ID was actually over on the left side. So that case number actually was uh, also embedded in the logs. Okay, so that's good if you had to manually do it. But in reality, we have the ability to just to use the app wall signatures. If you have automatic updates and you have app wall, again, I tried to do the attack here and you can see the app wall signatures were enabled. So I didn't have to create the custom WAF rule sets that I did just previously. In fact, I removed them. All right, we see that that has triggered an event here and it looks a little bit different. First, it has this icon uh, under refine, but also the threat name is different. It says code injection versus input validation violation. The results are the same. We were able to mitigate the risk but one was that we had to create a rule set versus the other that automatically uh, is updated. So if we go jump into the event itself, we see there is a pattern ID that's associated and the description is very specific to log4j. All the other details exist. Pretty neat.